on the word, speak to our hearts once again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the Gospel of St. Luke. St. Luke's Gospel, the ninth chapter. St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning with verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. <clears throat> And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. <clears throat> May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Now, as I read these, these men are three would-be followers of Jesus. And uh, the first one, it says, said, Lord, I'll follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now, that's, that's a good, now Jesus approved of that, I'm sure. And we don't know how the young man came out. That's a good thing. But Jesus reminded him, said, now, wait a minute. If you want to follow me, I want you to know that I don't have a place to lay my head. Uh, in other words, he wanted the young man, first of all, to consider what it meant to follow Jesus. Now, uh, Brother Helm gives us a very good explanation in the spiritual side that uh, Jesus needs a spiritual body to put the head on, but I want to jump over and stick with the material, the physical today. So here's a, a saying that he wanted this young man to consider the fact, now look, if you follow me, uh, I want you to notice there's no big appeal here to follow Jesus. There's no big appeal to it, but he's, he's telling the young man, now you want you to notice this. The second one, uh, he said, Lord, uh, suffer me first to go bury my father. Jesus said, follow me. So, and of course, we know by that the scholars tell us that that didn't mean the man was dead, but that he was to take care of his father until he died. And he said, Lord, let me take care of my father until he dies, and then I'll follow thee. And the third one, he said, Lord, let me go back and bid farewell to those which are at my house. Now, I want to ask you a question. You be honest with me. Does that seem hard? Now, don't, <laughs> like I heard Dr. Tozer say, in talking about how times, uh, and uh, he said that, I don't know, people lie when they pray. Now, don't lie to me. <laughs> Does that seem hard? Come on now. Let the dead bury the dead. Let me go bury my father. Let the dead bury their head. You want to follow me? I want you to know there's no, I don't have any place to lay my head. I want to go back and bid farewell to those in my father's house. He said, any man looking back isn't fit for the kingdom of God. I, is that hard? Of course it is. It's hard. But I want you to know, dear ones, that the world makes hard demands on people. If you want to succeed anything in the world, there are hard demands made on you. You look at the Olympics, many of you have been watching, no doubt, the Olympics, and every person who gets the gold, I want to tell you, they have endured some hardship to get it. Some of the younger ones have had to leave home. I had one young girl telling me she had to leave and go to another state to train. They've had to leave home. They've had to endure long hours of, of discipline and, and struggle and working at it. It's cost them a lot of money. They've had to forego pleasures of socializing or things. It's been hard. It's been hard on them. Every individual who's won the gold, I want you to know it's been hard on them. The business world doesn't mind making it hard on you. 
Men have sacrificed many, many things to go and discover oil and gold. And look at the people who tried to, in the gold rushes and other things they endured. Uh, the world demands things of them. Look at men who go into the armies. Look at the Peace Corps. They advertise the hardest job you'll ever lo love. I remember some years ago uh, hearing on TV a man was speaking. California started somewhat, and maybe some of you heard it, California started some kind of a program for young people to help in the state of California. And they were trying to recruit the young people. And I want you to notice what he said to the young people. Uh, I marvel that he got any of them to come and, and help him out. He was urging the young people, and he said, there will be long hours, low pay, hard work, miserable working conditions. And he said, and when you're finished, I won't thank you. Now, can you imagine getting any young people to follow that? Long hours, hard, low pay, hard, working, hard work, miserable working conditions, and when you're finished, I won't even thank you. Well, I, that, uh, now, he must have gotten young people to follow him. There are certain young people who took that up. Now, I know there's some who turned off. But I'm showing some of the demands that uh, the world makes on, on, on people. But I, I want you to know, why does Jesus make demands like this? Isn't he concerned about a man's father? Let the dead bury the dead. Isn't Jesus concerned about that? Or oh, here's the young man. Let me go bid farewell to them and my fathers. I want you to notice, it's rather interesting here, that all three of these are connected with the home. If you want to follow me, your hardest job is going to be to settle the question at home. So, uh, what is Jesus trying to get at here? I'm convinced he's concerned about that father. Uh, and it sounded like to the young man, don't pay any attention to him now. Isn't what Jesus is saying? You're going to misread that if you read that. He's certainly concerned about that father. I uh, made me think of this beautiful song the choir sang. Isn't it interesting how God will choose songs? The Lord, the Lord chose all the songs that were sung this morning. But that, uh, my times are in his hand. I've heard that for years, but one thing that jumped out at me again this morning in a renewed way was he will not cause his child a needless tear. Brother, I want to tell you, now that doesn't mean you won't cry. He said, a needless tear. He won't cause you a needless tear to follow him. Oh, that's wonderful. That I can, from here, I can go through life. You can start as a young person and go through life with Jesus. There may soon be some times when you won't understand and you'll cry. Maybe sometimes Jesus say, let the dead bury the dead. You may cry, but I want you to know Jesus will be in it and he'll not cause you one needless tear. So is he concerned about the Father? Of course he is. Is he concerned about a place to live? He said, I don't have any place to live. Is he concerned about a place to live? Of course he is. And if you think that following Jesus means you won't have a place to live, you're misreading it. And uh, leave your friends at home. Don't paint it. Don't even turn back. Don't look back. You're not fit for the kingdom. Isn't he concerned about those at home? Well, of course he is, and if you think he isn't, you're misreading it. Why? Well, how do I know that? Because Jesus said later on, if these dear ones would have followed him, he said, all right, you've left everything, you've left home, father, everything, but I want you to know that everybody who's left home and father and mother and lands for my sake and the kings will receive a hundredfold. Glory, glory, glory to God. So is he hard here? What's he trying to do? He's wanting them to trust him, whether you have a home or not. He's wanting you to trust him. If God says the kingdom of God, I want you to go preach the gospel, like he said to E. Stanley Jones, and I've mentioned it before, that great saint of God, that great Methodist preacher that went to India uh, and preached for years in India, became the great apostle to India. But as a young man, when he started to go, his, his mother was sick, and his brother told him, said, if you go to India, your mother, you'll kill your mother. 
And he went and prayed and said, Now, Jesus, you've called me to India, and I'm going to put my mother in your hands. You, you can take care of her. And he went to India, and God healed his mother. Was God concerned about his mother? Of course he was. He knew Jesus could take care of her. Oh, if we can get this balance in this. It's one thing to follow God, but what God is trying to do is to get us to trust him. I don't care what situation it is. If you're faced with not having a home, if you're faced with having to leave your mother or father, if you're faced with having to leave loved ones, I want you to know that Jesus is concerned about it too, but I want you to know that he knows about it and he'll take care of the situation. But he wants us to trust him. So a hundredfold. Well, this young man in California, another thing he said to them, he said, I won't thank you. Although this is, that was to go into uh, uh, lumber camps and things of that kind to help the state of California. He said, the reason I won't thank you, he says that you're enjoying many things that he said other people have had a price to give you and you owe it to future generations. He said, I'm not going to thank you for paying off what you owe. Well, I think he had a point. How much are we enjoying today because somebody paid a price? Somebody paid a price for us to sit in this beautiful building. Somebody paid a price for us to have the Bible in our hands. We pick it up and read it and have all different kinds of training. We don't understand that people died to get that in our hands. They died to do it. And people have paid a price to give us what we have received. Well, these three would-be followers, as I said, I want you to notice, they all had to deal with the home. And I suppose that one of the hardest tests in following Jesus is that of leaving the home in one way or another. So these three would-be followers, uh, they faced this test, and you and I will have to face it, and we think Jesus is hard. I think a lot of it because we don't know our human nature. I look at Acts, the eighth chapter, and the first and fourth verses. We find that persecution arose in the early church. And I read that, and I think, dear me, those that follow Jesus, persecution arose upon them, and it says they were scattered everywhere. Now, we haven't faced anything. You think we have it hard. I want you to know, and I, I often think we want a Holy Ghost awake, and I want to somebody, do we really want it? Do you know it's going to cost us something to have a Holy Ghost awakening? Do you know what it costs them? It costs them persecution, and it says they were scattered everywhere, everybody except the apostles. Scattered. Why did Jesus scatter those dear people? Why, why was he so hard on them? I want to tell you, they had to leave their homes, leave their possessions and everything. They left them. Well, it says a little bit later on, I think it's in the fourth verse, it says they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Not, not the preachers. Everybody. Everybody was a preacher. You say, I can't preach. Brother, they did. Come on now. They were scattered, the church was scattered, and they went everywhere preaching. Why was God so hard on them? They wouldn't have left home without it. He wouldn't cause them a needless tear. If they'd have gone without it, they wouldn't have had to have the persecution. The persecution scattered them. What will it take to cause us to bring us a Holy Ghost awakening? Will God have to send persecution once again to the Christians? That day may come. I remember hearing one of my professors years ago in college, and that was when everything seemed to be quiet at that time. He said the days of persecution aren't over. Well, that was an amazement to me. The days of persecution are not over. So these dear ones faced persecution had to drive them out. Dick Hill said the very same thing as great saint who was with the China Inland Mission in China. And he tried and tried and tried to get the Chinese to go out and evangelize, and they wouldn't do it. They wanted to stay home, go to their jobs, have everything work and find it is, and they left it up to the missionary. He could not get them. He said, look, this is demand of the Christian gospel to carry the gospel, and they wouldn't do it. 
Then he said the Chinese-Japanese War broke out. And he said it scattered the Christians everywhere. And he said, you know what? They went preaching the gospel everywhere. They'd go as a refugees, as refugees. They'd go into a town and say, is there some place we can sleep? And they say, well, there's no place but this heathen temple, but you can't sleep in there. And they said, it's all right. Our God will protect us. And your God will have a chance to preach to them. And when a little loved one would die and they'd bury him along the roadside and the people had a chance to come and watch a Christian funeral, they preached everywhere they went. And more Christians, when people were saved during that time than any other time. He will not cause his child a needless tear. But many times we bring many of those things upon ourselves. Look in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Moses is warning the people there. I'll not turn and read it, but he's warning the people there. He said, uh, uh, beware when you have good homes. Think of that. That's the time to beware when there's persecution. No, he didn't say beware when persecuted. He said beware when you have a good home. Any of you got a good home today? I have. Oh, I'm thankful. I, I never thought I'd live in such a nice home as I've got. The nicest home i ever had in my life. And I think I, I, I believe almost every time I drive into that driveway, I say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for this lovely place. Many times I'll walk through the house and say, thank you, Jesus for this home. Thank you for those trees, the birds, the flowers. Lord, I want you to know I appreciate it. I'm thankful. But he said, beware when you receive nice homes. So these three would-be followers, he's talking about the home because that's where the hardest tests usually are. So what will happen when we get a Holy Ghost awakening? Do we really want one? What's it going to cost us if we have one? How important is a Holy Ghost awakening? Well, I want to tell you, dear, dear ones, it may be the difference between heaven and hell for many people. And I want to tell you that's important, whatever it costs. For the things of the kingdom of God are worth more than anything we can build up on this earth. And I'm trusting God will help us to see that. So the, in the early church, it took the persecution to send them out. And uh, I'm trusting that God will help us here. But I want you to know it's a little secret here. Not a secret. It's not a secret, but it's a picture into human nature. Two of them said, Lord, suffer me first. And that's far enough to go. Lord, me first. Now, I'll follow you, and I'll do what you want, but me first. And then when I get that taken care of, I'll follow you. The second one, the very same, I mean the third one, very same thing. Lord, suffer me first to go home and bid farewell. He, he's, he, in other words, what are you doing? He's wanting his friends, his family, the things at home first. Now, I want you to know you can't take advantage of this. Say, Jesus wants me to leave my home or leave my family. Jesus said, I want you to know Jesus had to call them to do it, and they were obeying God. And if God calls you to do something, you do it, but don't you run off and do it unless he's calling you to do it. So don't you run off say, Brother Morgan told me this. Look at there were those even back in Jesus' day, they refused to take care of their parents. And uh, they said, look, we've dedicated it to God. We don't need him. Jesus, I tell you, he rebuked them for using it as an excuse. So don't use this as an excuse to do something you want to do. We do it to obey God, and to obey God may cost you to cry, not to rejoice. No, I don't mean preach at you here. You forgive me for preaching at you. But uh, I want us to get the truth of this. Me first. Lord, let me build my business first. Let me, let me get my kids through college first. Let me raise my children first. Lord, let me get a little bit in the bank first. Let me get a little security first. Let me first, Lord, and then I'll come and follow you. I want you to notice Jesus does not take the people who say me first. He said, no man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I... Uh, now, that's very, if those are, I don't know how many of you have been on farms or lived on farms, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. I never grew up on a farm. 
But I had the privilege one time to visit a friend of mine. He lived on a farm. He invited me out there one day. And lo and behold, he let me, he let me believe it or not, stand behind a plow and run a plow. I did that once. But he had to give me some instructions. He said, now, you, to, to guide this horse and this plow, he said, there's only one way to make a straight furrow. And then he said, you've got to pick out something in the distance. And he said, run that plow toward that in order to make a first uh, uh, a, a straight furrow you've got to pick out something in the distance and move toward that or he said your furrow will go all kinds of directions and you won't have a good plowed field so if you look any other way than right straight ahead at some distant object you'll not and Jesus said if you look back you will not be fit for the kingdom of God you can't go with Jesus and look back at something else I think sometimes we have no idea how serious the kingdom of God is and that we have no idea what it means to really follow Jesus. I thought of, the, the, again, the Olympic gold, the competitors. I heard on TV just the other night. No, I wasn't on TV. I read it in U.S. News and World Report. They were telling about the Olympics and those who get the gold. If a man, for instance, is on the diving board, they said... He cannot be thinking about anything else in the world. His mind has got to be entirely on that dive. He's got to be concentrating on it. And he can't think about anything else and win. Now, I want you to think about that. You talk about that's narrow. Here's a man that's a Christian. He's following Jesus. He's going all after God. It looks like he doesn't think about anything else. You say he's a fanatic. These men are fanatics. But many times we want to follow Jesus and me first, or we want to think about other things and come in then on a, uh, sometime and do Jesus a little something, think we're doing something wonderful for him. But I want you to know here, here in the Olympics, those that win the gold, they could not even think of anything else. If a man is running or whatever he's swimming or anything else, he cannot think about anything else other than what he's doing. He's after the goal. If we're after the kingdom of God, that's why Jesus is telling here, you, you can't think about those that are at home. You can't think about mothers and fathers. God interests, of course he is. But look, if you're trusting God, God's going to take care of them. He wants you to trust and know that he's interested in them. He's interested in you. He's interested in your home. He's interested in your having a home. But if the day ever comes when to follow it to God may mean to give it up, it may mean to give it all up. It may mean to give up our homes. I'm trusting that day never comes, but it may be. At least if a Holy Ghost awakening comes, I think we'll find our homes having to be open to every child of God coming through our cars. Everything else will have to be at the disposal of God. I can't say this is mine. And it's said of the early church, they didn't claim anything as their own. That means they did, just didn't go out and give it to everybody, let everybody have it. No, it's for the kingdom of God. When it came to the kingdom of God, then that was first. More than anything else they have. What a wonderful Lord we serve. And then he'll not cause his child to need us to hear. What a promise. What a promise that is from God. How marvelous to follow Jesus and give up everything to follow him. How marvelous to know that we can trust such a wonderful God. What looks hard to the world uh, is not hard. It's wonderful and marvelous. So I'm trusting that God will help us and to follow Jesus, that we'll follow him and not look back, and we'll put him first in everything.